right, well, let me go ahead and get started. I'm using an alternate slide deck than the one I was originally planning on using, so I apologize um, in advance on that. Um, but we're here to talk about web content accessibility, um, things that, um, you know, to, for you to be aware of, tools that might be of benefit to you and making sure that really you have kind of a general understanding of, of what it means to have an accessible website. Um, and then within DNN, I want to talk a little bit specifically around some of the things that you're going to run into as a site administrator, as somebody that's preparing websites for others to go through and, and work with. Um, because we get a, a lot of questions over time around, you know, what's going to happen? Um, well, we were, we were compliant, now we're not. How does that happen? What can we do to prevent it? Um, those types of things. So with this, um, you know, if you guys have questions, you know, I, I don't really intend, um, nor is there a lot of content without doing a real deep dive to stand up here and, and yak at you for an hour um, without going into some fairly specific things. So um, get my attention with any questions that you may have um, along the way. Um, and then we'll kind of go um, through things from there. So does anybody not know who I am? I guess I'll, I'll skip that content if you all know who I am. All right. If you have questions afterwards, come talk to me. It's fine. Um, but with all of that, so this slide deck is my professional slide deck. Something happened to my PowerPoint version of the non-branded as my company slide deck this morning. So um, I apologize. This is not meant to be a commercial session. But basically, what we're trying to talk about is accessibility. When we talk about it from a website thing, I can tell you today, here's the steps you need to do to go and make the change to your website and become compliant. But the fact that you're compliant today does not mean you're compliant tomorrow. Honestly, it doesn't mean you're compliant this afternoon. Okay? It's more of a mindset of how you're doing things is the bigger change. I can do a number of things. We can direct you to a number of tools to game the system, get the thumbs up that says you're accessible, but it's not going to be until you change your practices that you're going to truly be an accessible website going forward. Um, how many of you have content administrators, people other than you know, web developers that have access to edit pages in DNN? Okay, every single one of you will most likely have a site that you would make perfectly accessible that will be broken by basic content editor behaviors. Okay, it doesn't matter which version of DNN you're on, doesn't matter what version of the text editor you're using, and it doesn't matter how much you train your people, we don't have built-in things that say you must do things in an accessible manner. So are any of you working with organizations where the, con the concept of accessible websites is mandated, where you have to do something. Okay. So in some scenarios, right, when we talk about an access a, a website that's accessible, what we're talking about is making sure that it's not only available to users with regular vision, but we're making it accessible to people regardless of what disability they may have. Now, if we look at the regulations or the examples that are out there, a lot of times what we're seeing is, is we're going after those with either limited vision, so those folks may be using screen reading software. So rather than them looking at your website and consuming the content visually, they're using some sort of an automated tool, right, that is going to read your web page to them. So for them, certain tenets of the accessibility guidelines are going to be important around metadata. If I'm having somebody read your web page to me, do I care about your fancy graphics on your homepage? No. What I care about is what's the purpose of this image? Now, how many of you have loaded an image to a website and not added alt text? Okay. The rest of you that don't raise your hands, you're lying, and I'll just assume it was a yes, okay? The problem is, 
every single image that you leave without an alt text defined is a violation of the most basic accessibility standard. Because a screen reader is going to see that image, and what is it going to read to the user? It's actually going to read the full file path name of the image. Now, if you named your image appropriately, they may get something out of it, but I can tell you after three or four images, the people are going to give up on your website and move on. Okay? If there's alt text, it's going to be there. Now, what should that alt text be? Shouldn't be logo. It should be company logo or, you know, whatever your company name is, right? So that they understand what is, is there for, right? So we want to make sure that we're also thinking, right? What are these types of users? So we have low vision, which is going to be the people most likely using screen readers, right? That's when we talk about adaptive technologies, right? So if we look at all of the different kinds of things, you know, basically in here, we need to add some stuff to deal with it. Now, hearing impaired. Why will, I'm building a website. Why do I care about hearing compared? Any idea what, what would we have that would be a compliance requirement for hearing compared? Closed Either closed captioning or transcripts. If you look at most news websites now, right, they're pushing you, watch the video, watch the video, watch the video. And if you're like me and you despise watching videos, there's a handy link usually at the very bottom, right, that is view transcript. Or if you're watching some of the more fancy ones, they, when the video is playing but you have the sound muted, you'll see the text. Those are examples of people complying with accessibility requirements for those that are hard of hearing. Now, the one that people often miss is limited vision. Limited vision individuals, they can read, but maybe we have somebody that is colorblind. Maybe they're red, blue colorblind. They don't, can't tell the difference between red and blue. How would that work for us? What kinds of things might be important for us to validate from an accessibility perspective, that a person who's red, blue, colorblind can view our website. Any ideas? Supplemental category request to follow the letter of the reason. Bingo. One of the biggest things that we've been doing in the industry recently, right? Ooh, red buttons are danger. Blue buttons are successful. If you're colorblind, that's not going to help you much. The other thing that we see a lot when we run reports on accessibility is there are standards in the contrast ratios, right? So I may not be able to tell what color of red that box of text is, but it's a really dark content with a very light lettering on top of it. The color isn't important. What's important is it's a box that's grouping content together, and I can read the content. If a person can't tell those shades of colors, the text may actually blur together. If you've ever seen those uh, colorblind tests, you know, they go around on Facebook and other sites, right, where it's a, a, a circle with a bunch of blotches in it, and if you're not colorblind, you see, you know, 63, but if you're colorblind, you see 77 or something. I can't remember the exacts, right? But you see different things. That's the same kind of thing that's going to happen. If we don't have enough contrast between these colors, we're going to get there. So, it's all fine and dandy, right? I just rattled off a bunch of them to you. How do you know? How do you know what you need to do? What's a process to be able to go through this? Well, that's where we have to really take a look at if we want to comply, how do we do it? Right? We have to first of all start out and assess our site. What do we have today? Right? Most of the cases we're building something or working to improve something that's already out there, right? We're not starting from ground zero, so we need to take a look at where we're at. We also, during the assessment phase, we need to understand what's our goal, right? Now, I'm not as familiar with the European regulations, okay? Um, the European regulations are a little bit different, and I'll talk about 
some more things on the assessment side of things. Okay, but what we have to do is we have to assess. Once we know where we're at, we have to implement. Right? Those two steps are pretty standard, right? But what we really have to go to after that is we have to test and finalize what we do. So we can run a scan, build a fancy report that says, oh my gosh, you broke everything. Then you can fix all of the things that that test found. You're not done. We have to go back and retest. Um, it's almost like we sit in a loop, really, between assessment and implementation. I break it out specifically, though, into a testing phase, just to illustrate that you are assessing, implementing, and you're testing. Now, if you fail at that testing phase, you go back into your implementation. Once we get to a point where we're finalized, now we have to start talking about sustainability. And I'll talk a little bit more about the sustainability aspect of it um, as well. But the first thing, just to kind of you know, really drive through this, we have to figure out what we're doing before we do anything. So before we go out and pay a site improve $3,000, $5,000, $20,000 to do an assessment for us, we really should establish what do we need to accomplish. One of the most common things that is used is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, also known as WCAG, okay? The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines group things into three levels, A, AA, and AAA priority items. If we think about it from a technical perspective, A is easy, AA is a little harder, AAA is a royal pain in the rear end, okay? And it's very, very hard to get to AAA. Now, the specifics of all of these, you can go out and look at the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, okay? And decide where you need to go. But where you land in this scale is often going to be a compromise between what you may have to do. So, for example, in the U.S., public institutions, government agencies, they must adhere to double A level compliance because they are a public organization. Okay? Other countries have different regulations. Some people just want to be as accessible as they can. But I'm going to tell you right now, one of the fun rules of triple A compliance, it is not allowed to use target blank on a hyperlink. So every time you link to an external site, and you want them launching it up into a new tab, that does not meet AAA compliance. So a lot of times what will happen is, is people will come to us and say, we want the highest. I'm like, well then are you willing to compromise? Are you willing to change the way that you put your site together to meet the rules? Right? You can do it with a dialogue that says, hey, we're going to open and take you to this other site. If you've seen your banking site, for example, Maybe if you're logged into online banking and it takes you off to one of their partner sites and it s pops up a window that says, you are now leaving so-and-so's site, that's how they're complying with that AAA requirement that you don't ever use target blank. The reason why that requirement is there is if I'm a screen reader user, I'm not looking at the screen, right? How do I know a tab opened? That's the whole reason why there's a requirement in place to not do that, but that's at that highest, highest level of standard. So for you, what you need to do is you need to start looking at what's your level, and then over here, like I said, this is what, what we do, but the key here is we need to find a way to assess the site. Now this is where it gets a little bit tricky. There are free tools out there, such as Cynthia Says, um, which you can do web page by web page, right? So you can go through and say, is this home page compliant? And it'll spit out a report of all of your errors. You then have third parties such as SiteBeam, Site Improve, any, there's a plethora of tools out there now for compliance. Um, the pricing of those tools is gonna vary greatly depending on the number of pages, how often you want to do things, and those kinds of situations. But what we want to do is we want to use some sort of a tool during this assessment phase 
to validate and identify our, our issues. Now, this is where the technical implementers are most important. Because now what we have to do is we have to go look. Is it the skin? Right? Is it something we have in the footer that's on every page? That might be a quick hit. Is it something that's in the header? Again, might be a quick hit. Oh, it's in this welcome intro text that was put in by one of the content editors last week. We've now identified a training paradigm, right? a training problem that we have to address. So it's at this stage that we're trying to figure out what is it that we've got to fix. Once we know what we have to fix, then we can figure out the best way to actually make that happen. Okay? Now, I would love to tell you there's a way to do this without using third-party tools. I've, we've been working on accessibility stuff for people for at least the last three to four years as a, um, as a primary business thing for us. I still haven't found a good, reasonable, free way to do it. Okay? I hate coming to a conference and telling you go buy some tool, but if you want to do this right, which you should do it right if you're going to do it, you need the leverage of a tool. The other thing, for those of you, how many of you run independent consulting businesses or you build websites for others? Okay? So here's the other fun part for me in terms of why we also use third-party tools and why I've never built my own. Um, the third-party tools give you a report. You can then go to your customer and say, we validated you against web content's accessibility based on this tool's results. Okay? It's a bit of a protection for yourself, but it is a way, but it also adds credibility. It is not you as some random guy standing up on stage telling you to become accessible. It is a tool that was designed to validate it and pushes it there. I've actually found that when a client's on the edge of like, should we do it, producing a report out of one of those systems tends to drive them further towards implementation rather than, hey, you should fix this. Um, there is one tool that can run on your own machine that does not have a per site cost, and it's something called Sort Site Professional, S-O-R-T-S-I-T-E. Now, its name does not imply anything that it does, but it is going to use your computer to go out and do the crawling. Um, for those of you that are in consulting organizations, right, and you don't have a lot of budget to spend, it's like 500 bucks for a license. Its report isn't as pretty as everything else. But for you to implement, it's a great cheap way to get the ball rolling, to get an understanding. And I think they have a 30-day trial um, along the way. And I can, I can fill in if you have individual questions along the way of, of, of what to use. Um, that's great. So now, once we get these reports, what kinds of things might we have to do, right? Every single site is going to be different. But what I encourage you to do is when you go from the assessment to implementation process, when you go from looking at their website and deciding you want to fix it, try to do everything you can to freeze that website in place. Right? What we'll often do is we'll do an assessment on a Friday evening. We'll have an agreed upon scope that we're going to spend no more than X amount of time to resolve. And we will make fixes. Friday night and Saturday, Sunday we'll run another assessment. And the reason why we want to do this is it's ever-changing when you're scanning the whole website. So as much as you can do to scan, fix, and scan, you'll be able to identify exactly where you are. Because every time you open up the rich text editor, you're changing content. Okay? The things that exist in these rules are things such as alt text on links. If you go to the AA or AAA standards, you can't have a link that just says read more because it's not descriptive. That's one of the rules at the AA level. If you have a PDF document on a page, you have to have a link to the Adobe Acrobat download. 
If you don't tell them how to use a PDF, you're in violation. Right? It seems ridiculous, but that's the standard. Um, and that's, again, to the AA standard. So if you go to our website, Iowa Computer Gurus, and go to our like, free products where we have you know, PDF downloads of admin guides, I just stuff the here's how you download Acrobat at the very bottom of the page. It just has to be there. But those are the kinds of things you're going to be doing. Those are easy. The ones that aren't fun are the color contrast changes. So you may find out that your company colors are in violation of the complexity standards for contrast. If you have a company that has a yellow and orange logo and you use those as accent colors, the only way to become compliant is to break their corporate standard. Okay? And you're laughing because I'm sure you, you must have been there. But that is the hardest argument to make. And again, by giving them a tool that just says, here's the problem, right? What we end up doing a lot of times is maybe a company has three colors. They think that this one's their primary. Well, we may have to switch their website to use the other color because we need it to be there. DNN out of the box. You know the um, default submit buttons, right? We have the blue one, which is used in a lot of cases, which is the blue with the white text. That button is right at the limit. Its contrast ratio is within, I think, 0.1 of what it needs to be. The gray button, that cancel button, does not meet standards. So even the, that's the one piece of DNN, but it's not used very much anymore, that's there. DNN out of the box, though, otherwise, is 100% compliant to AAA standards with the most recent default theme. But that's with no logo, no footer, no content, so you can't really mess too much up, right? It's the menu. It's, it's the menu, it's the header and the footer. Right? So we get a, but we hear a lot, right? I, when I was talking about this at DNN Summit in February, everyone's like, well, but DNN's got to be compliant. Accessibility is 99.9% .9 your content. Now, where you can get in trouble is your third party module vendors. Okay? And I see a few of the third party module vendors in here. And I will encourage you that if you need to be compliant, talk with your vendors. Because if they've not tested their stuff, they're most likely going to be your biggest risk. Okay? Now, as you're doing this implementation, make note of where the errors came from. What we've found almost every time is that we have one or two content editors that just don't follow trainings. Right? We, we work with probably 100 DNN websites a year in one capacity or another. I used to do training manuals, right? Word documents. Nobody read them. Nobody ever referenced them after I did it. I spent a lot of time wasting away in Microsoft Word. We stopped doing it. So what we've started doing is we do 20 to 30 minute training tutorials. We do them typically once live via a screen share session, right? Join me, go to meeting, whatever you choose to use. And we record them and give them to them. And I start now with an accessibility guideline. And what I do is I walk through every single button in the DNN control, uh, the rich text editor, every single button in the toolbar. And I tell them, if you use this button, this is what you have to think about from a, a compliance perspective. If you use this button, this is what you have to do. Specifically, it's images and videos. But a lot of times, right, they use the, oh, I just embedded this, I'm good. Oh, I linked to YouTube, no big deal. It doesn't matter that you iframed that video. Now you have to comply with giving them some text, giving them some other direction along the way. So we really do try to make note during an implementation process, what were we fixing? How were we fixing it? So the tool found it, 
we fixed it, but then how do I stop it from happening again? Because that's as we go into the testing phase. So I had a report. I fixed all of the things in the report, and I validated it. One of the things that can happen, and this happens in all programming that we do, we fixed it, right? We did everything. Well, sometimes, even if you fixed everything, the test then runs further and decides that you didn't actually catch everything. So, at minimum, assess, change, and retest at minimum once. Because color contrast issues, for example. We've had this happen, unfortunately, more times than I care to admit. But we had a, a header color, right, that wasn't matching. We finally adjusted the header color, right, to a new color. Well, we didn't realize that on one page, they had a container that had a background. Now we're out of compliance on that page. Because that page worked with the old color, the new color doesn't work with it. So, because one change in DNN may hit all of your pages, don't ever assume that because you fix the results of a single report, that you've actually fixed it. Okay? If you, if you haven't gone to that next step of actually going through and retesting, it's, it's, it's really imperative to get there. Now, the last thing, when we go to do things and push them to production, this is, again, this is more of our process in terms of how we do it. But if you make a fix, you find all of these things that went wrong, but you never trained your content editors, well, then you just wasted a weekend. Because Monday morning at 8 o'clock, when that marketing person comes in and posts the new news release on the homepage, you're probably now out of compliance. Because it just so happened to be that that was the person that was posting every news release without alt text on your image. So you really need to make sure that when you go to finalize a change, that you include all of the things that you needed to do. That you go through and coordinate with everybody so that you know content going forward from here is important. Why? The, the go live being, in, being agreed upon is important because one of the things that we've done in the past is we've utilized that date and a simple database query off of the HTML text table to determine what pages we need to rescan. So if you know that the site was good on Saturday the 1st, you can then go through and run queries to see what content was updated if your site is primarily managed with the HTML module. Right? If you're using a bunch of other modules, that's not as practical. But even knowing the site was good on this date is a really important step of that compliance aspect. Because the other thing is, when it comes to the legality aspect of it, you want to know we got a gold star on this date at this time. Because it literally can change momentarily afterwards. Um, do any of you deal with user-supplied content? So forum posts, guest blog posts, anything like that? OK. So those scenarios produce a bit of a, a different problem. You, you can't always comply with that, because a random user is not going to be there. Now, depending on what country you're in, the rules don't always actually apply to you for user-supplied content, right? We would encourage you to, you know, use tools that will give the right experience, but I can't force somebody to put a, a good alt text when they embed an image in a forum post. So it's not going to be 100%. The user experience, in terms of the, the user that is using the screen reading device or, or otherwise, they're typically not going to be as upset about that kind of content either. Now, once you've done it, we have to make sure that we put things in place. So I fixed it. Or I, or sorry, I assessed it. I fixed it. I validated it. I trained my team. I'm done, right? No. 
we still have to set up a process and procedure to continue to assess it. So if you go out and look at the tools that are out there, Site Improve, Site Beam, and otherwise, they are not companies that sell you a single assessment. They are companies that sell you a year-long subscription. They are companies that have plugins for DNN so that when a page changes, they know the page changed so they can rescan it. And the reason for that is that's the cycle that you have to get into, right? Whether it's once a month, whether it's once a quarter, I hope it's no longer than that, you should be revalidating. If you stay on it, it's usually a lot easier to avoid getting backlogged with everything. I will tell you that doing compliance or accessibility to the AA standard on a blog site that has 400 or so blog posts is not a fun way to spend a week and a half of your life. When I went and took my own blog, MitchellSellers.com, and made it AA compliant, I couldn't write a blog post for at least a week because I couldn't log into the editor anymore. I was done. And it was always little things, right? I have, a, I have a blog post about, you know, here's how you do something in DNN. Like, here's what the host settings are in DNN. You know, I dropped all of those images in. I used similar names for all of the images. Wasn't relevant enough. Every time I linked to one of my open source modules or a speaking engagement, I used click here for more information. It's a violation of the AA standard. I rewrote the content, at least one paragraph of content in almost every single blog post that I'd ever written to comply with that level, right? So comply early, comply often, and validate is really the key to being able to do things. We do things, when we work with customers, we often will say, you handle it yourself each quarter. Once a year, we'll come in and do a, you know, we'll come in and do a secondary review for you. Or we're here to help when you do something really crazy that you can't fix, right? Um, tools like Site Improve, um, they happen to have a DNN plugin. Um, they will then know, oh, this page was updated, so then they'll update. A lot of the other tools, right, they scan your site once a week or once a month. You know, so you had to match your cycle of validation with the cycle of the tool that you're using. But in the end, as we go further along and we focus more on being accessible to users of all types, I think we're going to see more and more in this. As you create more HTML5 apps, as you create more interactive single-paged apps, you're going to find yourself at a crossroads because the single-page application interaction and the accessibility requirements will often clash with each other. So you will sometimes make a business decision, right? Do I want a rich user experience or do I want to be accessible? A prime example of this is, you know, your homepage banner? People love to put some of the most crazy things in those homepage banners. But a lot of times, to get it looking perfect, right, they're going to put a banner that goes across your entire page like this and it has words on it. That is an instant fail of level A because it is content only accessible visually. Even if you put in an alt text, that has the entire text of the image, you will still fail on the scoring tools. So it's going to change the way that you have to do things. So years ago, when we made the transition from non-responsive web design to responsive web design, you know those conversations we had with our clients of, I know you like that look, but you can't do that because it won't collapse down to a phone? We're now having those same kinds of conversations of you can't do that because it doesn't meet the accessibility requirements and you're going to have to compromise. I don't know how many times I've been told, but I don't want to link to the Acrobat reader. It is a requirement to do so. So we will, you will be having those kinds of conversations with your clients. Um, from a reports perspective, 
I wanted to just, unfortunately, my trial license to um, site improve, um, well, it's gone. Um, but what I wanted to do is they, the tools give you report cards. Okay, how many of you have played with uh, like Google Analytics PageSpeed Insights? Okay, how many of you tried to get a hundred? Okay, who said impossible? Because it's Okay. And <laughs> right, but it is impossible to get a 100 on Google PageSpeed Insights if you use Google Analytics. And how many people here don't you or wouldn't you or are, are not using Google Analytics? Not very many, right? So by following Google's own recommendations, you can't get a hundred. Okay, that same mindset with these tools is something you have to keep in mind. The tools test to A, AA, and AAA, but then they also test other stuff, right? They try to be this more helpful tool, okay? And it's a good thing, right? It really is a good thing because they're talking about site quality. But sometimes you're gonna see something like this, right? Fix what affects your visible, you know, your visitors most. Our unique DCI, I can't even think of what that, I can't remember what that actually stands for anymore. But their overall index blends accessibility with content quality, with other things. So what happens a lot of times is somebody says, okay, well, we're gonna use this tool that's great. But I got a 66.7, but you say I'm compliant. It's important to understand your tooling when you go to do this. Because there's a difference between doing everything that a site improve, a site beam, a sort site, whatever, says to do and meeting the requirements. Now they have separate reports that show you only A compliance or only double A compliance. And that's what you wanna make sure that you're actually digging into when you go to show things. Um, because in here you can kind of see they have multiple categories, and a little hard for you guys to, to see with the screenshot, but right, they have multiple categories. So you may be completely compliant with the usability and accessibility, but you may totally suck as a content editor. They may not like the fact that you do things. They do spell check as one of their tests. Um, spell check on a technical blog that uses the word .NET nuke a lot. Um, doesn't go well. Initial score is like 35% until you um, add about 3,000 words to the custom dictionary and then give up and just turn off that, that setting, okay? So just be aware, right? Just like the other tools, don't ever get into that mindset of I have to get 100 on everything, right? Be aware of the prize of what you're looking for, that prize being a AA or AAA compliance, not necessarily a 100 on the all ruling scoreboard. Um, because if you try to go that, that extra level, um, you'll just get yourself into um, a little bit of an interesting thing. And so what they do, so this is kind of a good example. They have a content inventory con concept, they have you know, spell check, they have readability, they have accessibility diagnostics. All of this rolls in they're slicing it and dicing it based on who might be the one fixing it. So, for example, link and spell check. It is awesome that they will check your website and tell you about every broken link that you have. Technically, a broken link, though, is not an accessibility issue. It's a crappy webmaster issue, but it's not a I don't meet requirements issue. Spelling as well. So you can factor those things out by that category. Um, same thing with readability. You know, I work with government agencies, I work with school districts. We actually have requirements that we can't go above a certain flesh Kincaid readability level for certain content that we publish. If it's designed to go to all parents of all students of a K through 12 organization, it cannot be above an eight for eighth grade reading level. 
uh, yeah, sometimes it's very hard to get that content to that level um, for those of us that apparently like to put big words in. But great tool, part of their suite, not applicable to do you meet accessibility requirements, unless that's a secondary rule that you have. And my only point here is, just like everything else, know your tool, be able to do things in a manner that is um, going to meet your needs and everything else. They even have some GDPR stuff. I haven't looked at it recently to see exactly what they're doing. Um, but again, whichever one you choose, you want to talk about specifics, I can gladly assist. Um, questions? Yes. So you'll be able to then take those rules if you want it and actually go on Yeah, and that's actually the quality of the tool. I mean, and I, I lump that into quality of the tool is, is really um, site improve, sort site, and I can't think of the, the, so three of the tools that I've used, when they give you a failure, they actually link you to the documentation of what the rule is. And false positives are a thing. Because unfortunately, we're using a tool, and their implementation and your implementation might be different. And I think that's going to be huge. But I don't. Do we have a published date yet on when that's supposed to be out? You mentioned that some, a group of people are meeting in June. Right. I, I it's. Yeah, it, I mean, it is the two one release of those guidelines is going to be really good. And I'm, I'm curious from a U.S. perspective though. When is 2.1 going to be applicable? Because we just recently in the US got the 2.0 standard to be the requirement. There used to be an old set of rules, very limited set of rules called Section 508 compliance in the US. I don't believe that was applicable to anybody in Europe. I'm pretty sure that was a US regulation. Those rules were established in, I believe, the late 90s or early 2000s. I, I'd had to go back and and look through the notes of when it came up. But it took a long time just to get that adopted, and then we got the 2.0 stuff, and they finally were like, okay, let's migrate to here. So I don't know how quickly we would get to 2.1. I hope it comes out, because publishing the rule criteria of evaluating would be fantastic. Because um, one of the biggest ones that a false positive happens is you are required to have a skip link. So you're required to have a hidden link as the first selectable HTML element in your page. Now, DNN oftentimes will fail that. It fails it because they detect view state as a selectable field. Their tools are broken. It's not. It's a hidden field. So how do you validate that? That's where various companies provide manual testing validation, okay? You can test for the most part on your own, just load the page, tab, hit enter, see what happens. It should jump your cursor to pass your menu if you have a proper implemented skip link, but that's not 100%. The best way to really know is to pay somebody that has a screen reader and, and leverage that. Um, and, and leverage that to validate. Um, and then just, you have to keep aware of the guidelines. Because I think with 2.1, the rules are being published with it, but I don't think there's a lot of change, at least not the last I had heard. I don't know, I'm not sure which webinar you were listening to. I'm kind of curious. Oh, Deb. Yeah, De uh, Deb from Sight and Proof. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, and that's, that's the other, you know, desktop is, is where we're focused a lot. Um, any of you have an idea of what assistive options are even available here? Magnify and so on. 
magnify. So it's magnify and high contrast mode are the most universal. Now, high contrast mode, have any of you ever turned that on? I challenge you, find a, a very colorful website. Turn on high contrast mode and see if you can read anything. Now, I don't know if that'll ever be a requirement that your site has to work in high contrast mode, but if it does, I will tell you right now, uh, those of you that are designers, uh, we got a lot of business for you, a lot. <laughs> because you will have to redesign a lot of websites um, to get there. So just keep a aware of it. It's just like everything else we do. It is literally a moving target. Um, every, day, every day is a little bit different, and that's where clear communication of what you've done. Um, any of you concerned about the legal aspects of it? This is, you know, my, I've dealt with way too many clients, they've dealt with way too many lawsuits. Aspect is, in the terms of use, once you've complied, and once you've set up a rule of how you're complying, add to your terms of use. This website has been implemented and validated against these terms and conditions as of this date. What that does is it sets a precedent that you've done something that will prevent you from getting into trouble. Now, again, country by country, that's going to be a little bit different. But there's a precedent going in the United States. So the reason why this is so important and why, like, you know, Deb from, um, uh, from Site Improve and stuff was wanting to go to Southern Fried and everything else, there is an organization in the United States that is going around and making about two to three hundred lawsuits a month going after very specific niche markets. So if you are a public education institute in the United States, your life really sucks if you've not complied because they are literally going through the list. Um, the best guess I can see so far is they are starting at the top of the, uh, stop, top of the alphabet and working their way down. If the website isn't there, they're filing complaints. If those complaints don't get rectified, then they're filing lawsuits saying that you're discriminating against the student body. Okay, they've also been doing it to credit unions and banks in the United States. So what's happening is this perpetrated itself really by people trying to come after you. Now, you get a lawsuit coming in and it's from one of these big groups and you can say, well, no, we've implemented this standard. We're uh, working to potentially achieve a greater standard, but we've made a conscious decision. We've seen a couple instances now. There's been two examples, and I had to look up the specifics, but the court cases have actually been thrown out because the organization had a plan. There is a bill being, JR, you're back there, right? The Florida thing, that was a Florida senator, right? Yeah. So, Right, it's a, basically, it a, would be a Florida regulation that would bar a lawsuit if they had a plan, correct? It's a, yeah, Florida regulation, but it's already been taken to Washington, D.C. Okay. And So we're seeing a bunch of jerking around, you know, in terms of how that gets done. Yeah. And it's, uh, there's some sort of thing that can reach your website. Uh, uh, is that using the same technology as to check if the website uh, is according to the, uh, the A or the AA standard? Uh, in terms of like the ones that can read, like a Google Chrome plugin that can read it? Um, more than likely, that's going to be similar in nature, and you'll see the same behavior. Um, I know specifically that the A and AA rules are geared towards, like, JAWS for Windows and similar, truly designed for limited site individuals. Um, I, 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 we could, if you, we could chat real quick, and I can take a look and see, but in the end, 
any tool that can read the site is probably going to suffer the same limitations. All right, well, I hope it's been helpful. You know, this is a, a hard one because it's every website's different. So I can't just come up here and tell you, go fix this. What I can tell you is, here's a good process to be able to fix it, to be able to know what you need to and, and go from there. So if you have questions, let me know. But otherwise, thank you.